So good morning, no matter, or good evening, or good late night, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we're going to be working on our, uh, our background images for that uh, starting one minute. We're going to get a little bit more earth tones, maybe a, an image of a Spanish guitar, since uh, Dr. Vega has us going with the Spanish guitar thing. We're trying to take over the world. There you go. <laughs> I can think of uh, worse things to take over the world than Spanish guitar. <laughs> How are you today, Doc? I am very good. How about you? Really good. Uh, I think it's a good day to talk prevention, right? It is. So one of the things that uh, people love to talk about is processed food. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. First of all, what is it? We're also going to talk about... <clears throat> This is your brain on processed food, uh, and it's not pretty. It, and who's going to be surprised about that? But there's some distinctions that might cause a little bit of uh, pushback, a little bit of debate in terms of you know processed foods on the meat side. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's for then. Right for right now, let's go back into uh, the intro to the the show today. We're also going to be talking about depression. And it's interesting that by far the least expensive, maybe easiest, maybe not, but the most easily accessible treatment for depression is right there available to you. And it's not a pill. And we're not using it that much. And it's like, what's going on? If, if this were labeled, it's a lifestyle issue. Exercise. If it, if exercise were labeled as a pill, it would be very uh, labeled as very effective, as effective as any of the pills that are available. So we'll talk a little bit about that and maybe get into a little bit of rant about people not exercising. <clears throat> so if you if you're new to the channel, what we do is we talk about the things that are most likely to disable and kill you. And uh, a whole lot of that boils down to one thing, unrecognized, undiagnosed carbohydrate metabolism problems. There are other issues, but none of them as important as that one issue. If we could get rid of that one issue, if we could conquer unrecognized carb metabolism issues as people age, the whole world would be a very, very different place. It'd be getting a lot older, too. So topics that we cover, <clears throat> we go into, you might think, well, you know, that's only one or two topics, but the reality is if there's something that, that's killing and is disabling more people in the world than anything else, a whole lot of things touch that issue. For example, we talked about telemedicine last time. Telemedicine is a major unrecognized, unutilized opportunity. Um, Guess what happened, though? There was a thing called the pandemic and a shutdown associated with it. And guess what happened? Those uh, those folks, those baby boomers, the people that are that are middle aged and just couldn't wrap their head around seeing a doctor remotely are doing it. And uh, it's creating a whole new set of opportunities, even in the uh, the Medicare world where we're making our transition. We've talked about empagliflozin. It's like one of the new uh, black bluster, black bl easy for me to say, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I believe me, I understand. <laughs> 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 Bl blockbuster, you meant, right? Yeah, it, it's those last two or three syllables, gliflozin. That's, uh, they, well, I don't know what, who named that drug, but yeah. he must have had a wicked sense of humor. Anyhow, the point behind empagliflozin was, uh, it imp it works with the kidney. Uh, basically, it just shuts down the kidney's uh, ability to pull glucose back into the blood. So when the kidney spills glucose, it stays out. And that is that can be a good thing if you have prediabetes or diabetes. So we go into the details on that study. You know, the one of the questions was, well, what if you have kidney failure? Can you still use it? That was an assumption that you could not. But once you actually look, hmm, the story was a little bit different. Now, we, uh, we followed up on, um, 
on our friend's uh, lean mass hyper responder study. I'm blanking on, I'm having a- David, I'm, David Feldman. Yeah, there we go. Dave Feldman. Um, he appeared on the show. He's an engineer. He's done great work in terms of delineating this thing where I get a call or two every month from somebody who's in a mad panic. And here's what the call goes like. It's, hey, Doc, you know, I went on low carb and all of a sudden my LDL shot out the roof. So then I went to see my doc and my doc panicked and he tried to put me on 80 of atorvastatin or 40 of, of Crestor. And it's like, ah, oh, don't do that. There's a whole lot of uh, information that you need to be aware of before you start going down that pathway. And it has to do with lean mass hyper responders. And this is not. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Interestingly, the assumption with lean mass hyper responders, because they have a high LDL, that they're likely to have a heart attack. And that's basically the new study that Dave is conducting with another set of experts on trying to get that evidence scientifically and say that that's not the case. So that's what they're working on right now. And, and so the way it ends up looking is these people can get a LDL of 200, 250, 300. And not only is that a sign, not a sign of a, of a coming heart attack, it appears to be a sign of improving health, improving cardiovascular health. So it's like, Mm. Just when you thought you could simplify things, not so fast, but it's a critical piece. Speaking of critical pieces, the um, <clears throat> it's uh, and critical pieces going unrecognized. Uh, my old uh, friends at, at Hopkins first started discovering that the people that we rely on, the primary care docs, two thirds of them don't know how to diagnose prediabetes let alone how to manage it. So there you've got the thing that's killing and disabling more of us than anything else. And the guys that are supposed to be leading us don't really know how to lead. So we've developed courses. They're simple, they're easy. Within a couple of hours, you can know a lot more about insulin resistance, cardiovascular inflammation, or just how to evaluate plaque than about two thirds to three quarters of primary care docs out there. Hey, Sus, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, other uh, ways they can access us? Sure. So our main channel is YouTube. So most of our viewers come right here. But we have a set of community on, on Locals. So there's some exclusive content over there if you want to take a look at it. And we were approached by Rumble a few months back. So we went and expand over there as well. So if somebody's watching us on Rumble as well, uh, we appreciate that you're following us. So there are uh, some options over, over there for you to see this content. The, just, just like last week, Dr. Brewer mentioned the book, not so new anymore, but it's critical information that you want to know. Uh, 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 different, differently to what Dr. Brewer used to say, when, that you're going to get uh, you're going to get a good, nice sleep reading the book. I don't think that's the case. The, the book is really good. I think uh, if you're looking on how to do prevention, probably the book is not that it's not going to provide those key codes, but it's going to provide you on why a stress test is not what you need. It's going to provide you on how to find that plaque. And then you can re just reach out to the YouTube channel to know what to do about it. Um, the straight Medicare pilot, let me tell you, we have a lot of people waiting for us. We have a huge response. We're doing a lot of work on that side. We are actually right on this week, we started calling and sending emails to folks who are on the waiting list. So if you are already on that waiting list, you should wait uh, for an email or a phone call on the next week, sort of a couple of months. Uh, the Physicians Network. So we have a lot of patients who reach out to us and, and tell us, hey, uh, I really would like to see a doctor near my facility or near my town that uh, thinks like Dr. Brewer, where can I find him? Where can I find that doctor? Uh, so what we did was just to set up this community for training physicians on how to do prevention. So uh, just take a look at it and send your doctor over there if, if 
you have a doctor that will be interested to learn more about this, uh, believe me, most primary care physicians are not uh, aware of the changes on the evidence on this side. And there are a couple of them that have reached out to us and that are interested in learning new ways and different ways to do prevention that work for everyone. So um, for three years of my life, I was the chief science officer. My only re responsibility was to teach the doctors at a large fee-for-value company. Uh, one of the best out there, probably the best. It's called Physician Partners. And um, my goal was to teach their doctors how to recognize life-threatening disease or life-impacting disease before they had tissue damage before they would normally recognize it. So I basically, we basically took that information and created our own information for docs. Uh, and we're starting to get some uptake. Some docs are starting to give us a call and say, okay, what can we do? How do I get uh, hooked up with this network? So we had another, we have another thing going on. We recently started working with full scripts so full scripts have a kind of a um, list of supplements that they manage and they have some quality assurance protocols over there. We took a look at, it, at those and uh, we're confident that you can find some good supplements over there. We listed a couple of protocols with some supplements that Dr. Brewer recommends depending on your condition. So you might want to take a look at it and... Uh, once you go there and see those, hit us, hit us with, a, with your questions regarding those supplements. We have covered a lot of them on the channel before. Dr. Brewer has done a lot of work on that side as well. Supplements are really popular, and we want to make sure that you're getting them from a place that is safe and it's going to work for you. So, you know, <clears throat> one of the most commonly given uh, drug classes right now is SSRIs. Uh, serotonin uh, sparing reuptake inhibitors. And those, uh, forget the, the technical jargon, they are antidepressants. And <clears throat> what's very interesting is lifestyle, like so many chronic diseases, lifestyle is at least as good, probably a lot better, and it doesn't have a cost. It doesn't have uh, negative side effects. And yet we just don't think about using it. This was an article out of the British Medical Journal in January of this year titled Exercise as Medicine for Depress Depressive Symptoms, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis with Meta-Regression. So one thing that people don't know is that depression is, in many, many ways to look at it, it would rank as the number one, the leading cause of disability worldwide. Two thirds of adults remain untreated. It's, uh, there's a great treatment, it's called exercise, but the evidence hasn't been updated. So what happened, if, uh, the researchers for this BMJ article said, we're gonna go back and do a meta-analysis. You remember in a, a meta-analysis is where you take all the studies that are applicable to a certain topic. And the topic here was uh, exercise is medicine for depression. Then you go back, you classify them, categorize them, reanalyze them, and see what does the, the major part of the literature on this, the science on this topic say. So the, the objective was to estimate the efficacy of exercise on depressive symptoms. They included controlled trials uh, with participants age 18 and older with the depression, with the diagnosis of depression, major depressive disorder, depressive symptoms. And they investigated the effects of exercise versus non-exercise groups. There were 41 studies involving over 2000 participants included. So, Jesus, what did they find? So uh, they figured out after including all those studies that those studies that included exercise as one of component, one of the treatment components, uh, patients who were on the group of exercise did see an improvement on symptoms. And one number that that came to my mind and that I when I saw that is, if they needed a number to treat of two, that means that from every ten people you treat. 
at probably eight of them, it are gonna get some benefit. It's like it, it it's impressive that so that exercise can do so good for a lot of people. Some some studies that are efficacious for medications and other diagnosis um, uh, strategies found that number to treat of three hundred or two hundred. It, it's it's a really good number, and finding a number needed to treat as two, it's it's a really great great result on this side. Now, by being critic of the study a little bit, uh, there there they did saw that there's a moderate to large effect on exercise on depressive symptoms, even when limiting the analysis to low risk of bias, meaning they choose some of those studies has a really high standard studies that didn't have uh, selection bias. And when you say selection bias, it's like if you're including only people that you think unconsciously, consciously or unconsciously that are going to get benefit or not. And they saw improvements on those people as well. Other important finding is that exercise is not inferior to current first line treatments. Not all uh, studies compare exercise versus medications. But on those studies when where they compared exercise versus medications, they saw that exercise is almost as effective as medications. Uh, but we don't know if this exercise benefit is going to last long. And I'll say it's because studies are not uh, following people for all, all that time, maybe 10, 20 years. That's not happening. And of course, exercise depends on if you're still getting to doing that. So, and it's it's difficult sometimes to assess um, the power of a meta analysis because a meta analysis is only as good as the studies they're including. So a couple of points. Um, any thoughts about how exercise might impact depressive symptoms? The mechanism. Mm, I I think that it has to do a lot with the brain endorphins. So when you when you break when you when you go up past the 15 minute mark, when you start doing exercise, it's it's painful, mm -hmm. especially if you haven't done that in a few months and a few years back. And then you want to try to retake your exercise routine. It's hard. It's, it, it hurts on the muscles. It's tiring. If you are depressed, it might lead you to quit on the first 10 minutes and you don't get to see the benefits. But once you break out that. 15 minute mark and you get the second air or second grasp of air second win second win that's the that's the word uh you're definitely gonna see improvement and as time goes by you're gonna get your brain trained on getting those endorphins from exercise and that's when you where you're gonna when you're gonna see the benefit so i think mm -hmm. that's one side i uh there should be another more metabolic component over there that i think you're gonna talk about I think I think there is, and but I'm glad you mentioned endorphins because that's such a major issue. I was thinking about sleep. So if exercise does help you sleep, if exercise, on the other hand, does help you release endorphins, then all of a sudden that tired, um, you know, the, the name of that nucleus is the ventromedial nucleus of the brain. That's the center of of uh, reward and uh, it's also failure in that nucleus is uh, is what leads to depression you know it's sort of like uh, getting out there working out getting those endorphins going that kick starts it and then uh, when you're able to sleep that helps you know revive that engine re revive and renew to me that last statement that weasel wording that they put in the end that almost everybody puts there's still not ev enough evidence to support this or that long term you know as you brought as you brought out <clears throat> i'm not sure how important that is because um i don't expect me exercising today to help or prevent a depression i get into a year from now i need to exercise then exactly um, the other, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Should. The other thing that I'll point out is this image on the right. That's called a whisker plot. Um, for the biostatisticians in the group, 
So what you're looking at is probably one or two standard deviations. Uh, what is that? 2.5 standard deviations. Yeah. 2.5. Um, so it, so the dot is the, the number that they found in that each, each uh, dot with those are whiskers on each side and each dot with whiskers represents another study. Uh, the, how far the whiskers go actually is maybe a little bit counterintuitive. You may think that means it's a, a bigger study. Usually it's not. Usually it's a smaller study because that means the, num the real numbers could be anywhere in that range, that line going from one, the left end of the left whisker to the right end of the right whisker. So as you begin to look at that, with that in mind, you begin to get an understanding and a picture. Look at where all the, so no impact at all is 0, 0.00, the line in the middle. So then you begin to look, okay, this is certainly not a random distribution where you have the dots uh, aligned around randomly uh, around the 0, 0.0. In fact, when I look at it, I see, I see only two dots that came out on the right side of the zero. So very, very powerful statistical evidence already just in looking at the, at this whisker plot. The other thing to think about is, okay, so if a, if a whisker crosses over that uh, 0.00, then it also means that, well, this could be just a random occurrence. If the whisker, if neither of the whiskers crosses over the 0, 0.0, again, it's saying, well, there might be bias as, as Jesus has mentioned, but statistically at least, if there's no bias, statistically, it's extremely unlikely that this is a random event. Now let's go back and look. I see out of how many studies was it? 20 something? 40, 40 something. Six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I see 13 out of all of those whisker plots that crossed over the zero line, which could be random. So it's like an overwhelming majority of these statistically saying, this is not a random impact. Uh, this is a very, very strong image showing that something is going on here. And I think that something is exactly what you talked about. You're kickstarting that ventromedial nucleus after having it, you know, it's just getting tired and uh, you're exercising it. You're kicking those endorphins into place. And then after you're tired, you can go, go to sleep and replenish and get that uh, nucleus going again for the next day. Any other comments before we go? That, talking about that um, graph, if you see the red, dot at the bottom that's the average oh, so yeah. it, it is it's like 1.5 and 1.5 is uh, that's that's where i'm a little bit critical of the study because 1.5 might not seem that as as that much but it's a frequent beneficial uh component and we have to understand that studies all of them are quite different in regards of the severity of depressive symptoms so it's very likely that you're seeing high benefits on low depressive symptoms and you're seeing lower benefits on ma major depressive symptoms, but there's benefit anyway. And thinking that exercise alone is gonna cure depression, maybe that's, that's a larger jump to do. But I, I think if we can conclude that exercise is critical to improve depressive symptoms, as and added, added to another options of treatment, that's a more realistic overview of the results of this study. Well, you bring up a really good point and I've, I'm glad you did. So it looks almost as if that red dot does not have whiskers on it. Yeah. But that's not true, it does have whiskers. And look how short those whiskers are. So again, what that means is, uh, Statistically, once you start, and that's the power of looking at an, a meta-analysis where you have so many uh, data points 
statistically, the probability of um, of exercise not positively impacting depression is just really low. Now, <clears throat> a couple of other things about just the science associated with depression. There, there are three big things that have uh, shown significant impact. Two others would be um, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and then uh, medications. The reality on the medications, though, is if you look at the uh, dot and whisker plot on medications, I don't really think it is as good as the whisker plot for exercise. So, um, you know, the science is really clear. Medications, ah, okay, maybe, maybe not. Exercise, it's a, a slam dunk. There is no question. Exercise is huge for this. And C, uh, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is also very, very good. Anything else about depression? I just want to clarify. You you said CBT, not not CBD, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> it's, it's, okay, it's not uh, cannabis, uh, although <laughs> uh, we've actually covered cannabis, and it's not yeah. as uh, not as uh, bad as a lot of people think. So once uh, Gilbert gives us the water ball, we'll get into the show for today. So everybody loves to hate on ultra processed food. And today we're going to talk about, there's a, there are good reasons for it. In fact, we're going to talk about your brain on ultra processed food. Hey, Sus, you want to tell us about it? Yeah. So first thing I want to comment on is we might want to be on the same page when we talk about what is ultra processed foods and if if somebody if somebody of you viewers right now uh, saw when we first sent uh, the thumbnail for this topic last week, you saw that our our tech team put some images of hamburgers, French fries, and all stuff like that. And I reach out to them and tell them, okay, so some of those foods are made with some ultra processed foods as well, but not all of them. And I think a better image is what you saw in the intro, which is basically seeing all these frozen products on the aisle, on the supermarket, on the freezers. So ultra processed foods are actually formulations of ingredients, mostly of industrial use only, derived from series of industrial processes. Basically, foods that are processed by the industry to last longer. And that includes breakfast cereals, savory snacks, reconstituted meat products, franks, Prepackaged frozen dishes, soft or sweetened drinks, and distilled alcohol beverage. So, when you think about that, uh, I saw a, a reference when looking for those specific definitions because that's the NOVA classification. Those are the ones who determine what is what. And some in some sources they mention supplements as part of ultra processed foods, but I didn't find that. I didn't see that. And you can think that uh, supplements might have a really industrial setup of work behind them to package package those on a pill, and that's truth. However, those are basically macronutrients specifically targeted to be on one specific pill, and there's not so much chemistry behind that as it is for other types of food that are more complex. Now, uh, on this study, this study was presented on the Alzheimer Association International Conference in 2002, last, 22 last year. And the background information behind this is that there is evidence that consumption of uh, UPF, ultra processed foods, has increased in the last 30 years. That's part of the evolution that we have had as humankind. And it's associated with cardiovascular disease, cancer, inflammation, and oxidative stress. And little is known about the effects of UPF, uh, UPFs on cognitions. And the authors of this study analyzed data from another study, the ELSA Brazil study, 
which is a study that lasted for nine years of follow-up to identify the impact of UPFs on co cognitive decline. So that's what they presented. This is a, basically the information from an abstract on that conference. So what they did is they measured uh, the participants in three different waves and three different set of uh, periods of time. And they used a food frequency questionnaire. So when you use one of those surveys, right at the beginning, I mean, it's hard to measure what somebody is eating if you don't have them inside a facility. And they, they're just depending on what the participants are answering on that questionnaire. Uh, they also used a cognitive performance uh, test uh, to evaluate different sets of cognitive functions such as verbal skills and memory. And the association between consuming UPFs, uh, meaning a total daily gram intake with cognitive performance over time was evaluated using different models to adjust for sociodemographic lifestyle and clinical variables. So I think this is the most important component of this study. When you, you, when you see a study that does regression models, meaning they are taking out the impact of other factors that might involve or might be uh, related to the final outcome. They are basically measuring what is the specific impact of consuming ultra processed foods on cognitive decline, taking out other, fa other risk factors. And what you see on the table over there, uh, they divided that into five quintiles, meaning quintile one is those folks who didn't eat more than 10% of ultra processed foods. And quintile number five are those who their diet is basically uh, ultra processed food, more than or between 25% to 70%. It's interesting that that's not on the slide, but uh, the table, the complete table, shows that the distribution of people with hypertension, diabetes, other chronic diseases is basically the same between the groups. So that, that gives a lot of uh, clarity on the impact of UPFs on this study. And the study, is, it's fairly big. They included around 8,000 participants. And they saw that the mean calorie intake was more than 2,000, almost 3,000 calories per day. And almost 20% uh, or 30% was an average of UPFs. And in the fourth and fifth uh, quintiles versus the first one, there was uh, a clear decline in executive functions and memory performance. Not so much effect on verbal uh, fluency. And their conclusion was that there is an association between UPF's consumption and memory, and specifically executive, executive, executive function domains for people who eat around 25 to 70% of UPF's on their daily uh, diet. Epidemiologically, you know, when you're looking at the science of evidence, uh, one of the very, very strong things is, a, uh, is what we call a dose response curve. And in this case, it would be if you saw it where uh, quintile two was a little bit, three was a little bit worse, four was worse, and five was the worst. You don't have that clear of a pattern, but it's, uh, it's not far off. So again, I think this is fairly, you know, that speaks very well of the quality of the evidence that we're looking at. Definitely. So... Uh, here's another point, another question. Before this, before the show, we were talking about, hmm, Frankfurters. Tell me what you think about Frankfurters. <laughs> we, we, we were just discussing that. So, uh, and, and I totally forgot because we did mention, we want to we wanna talk about it. Uh, ultra processed food are usually like packaged on the same category, all of them, independently of what they have inside of it. And we mentioned supplements. And I was sharing with Dr. Brewer, part of my uh, background is occupational medicine. And when I was studying that, I got to visit a lot of companies. And one of them was a company that used to do Frankfurt's. And believe me, after seeing the process of how they do Frankfurt's, I, I, I stopped eating those like for a couple of months. Uh, however, we were just discussing that. Um, there's not so much of a 
epidemic epidemic um, on people getting sick of eating frankfurts as it is from eating carbs so even on ultra processed foods there's a difference between protein and carbs and what you really see with meats um it- more than anything else, processed meats have appears to appear to have significant uh, increases in nitrosamines. It's a thing that uh, is used to preserve the meat. Um, the The point that I was making is yes, you'll see stuff about nitrosamines uh, hit the news every now and then. For example, I believe one of the uh, well uh, metformin. And a lot of the, uh, the ARBs, like um, Lasartan, many times you'll see these press releases where they different uh, uh, groups, different uh, production uh, components of these medications have been pulled. So you get these large um, amounts of those drugs that have been recalled they're being recalled because of the nitrosamine associated with it. Now, <clears throat> one of the things, yes, and nitrosamines have been associated with cancer. They haven't been associated so much with the things that, uh, that are more, much more likely to kill us in terms of uh, diabetes. The other thing that this tends to ignore is the fact that um, nitrosamines are also created every time you grill food. So every time you go to a restaurant and you have food that's been prepared on the grill, every time you uh, grill food at home, you're usually getting a significant in uh, a significant amount of nitrosamines more than you get from the medic, these medication lots that have been recalled. So uh, Jesus spent a lot of time as an occupational medicine doctor. I did too. And, one of the things that you do in that space is not only just look at uh, the epidemiology, you know, the science of the data, but you also look at the science of toxins. And if we, if as a culture, we screw one thing up, it is understanding toxins. So, <clears throat> again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have debates. I, I expect that we'll get some uh, major pushback on st- this statement, but I'm still going to make it anyway. I'm not nearly as worried about Frankfurters as I am the uh, cereals, the other carb-laden uh, ultra-processed foods that we're talking about. Now, one of the things, one of the, uh, again, another epidemiological question here, a data quality question. So w- assuming somebody wants to get into that debate, they'll probably say, well, wait a minute, uh, show me some data. Well, here's the problem with showing you data and evidence. Um, these, these guys, the researchers that developed this, approached their study with the assumption that hot dogs were going to be just as bad as cereals. So they never created any uh, parts of this study which would compare the relative impact. That's item number one. There's another problem, too, and that is... Think about the number of uh, the uh, the type of food habit. Uh, the people that eat cereal are also likely to eat hot dogs. And so you get overlap in both of those areas. Their participation bias, study design bias, things that the, the data is the science is just going to suffer from until and uh, until some changes happen. And I'm not holding my breath for those changes. <laughs> Any other comments, Dr. Vega? I do have, and I do, and it, this is a personal experience. When I was a medical student, uh, I had to travel abroad and be away from home, right? And uh, I'm I'm not the most skilled cook that you will see out there, and sometimes time time restraints are hard on medical school, and any, anybody can tell you that medical students and even physicians, most of them have the worst eating and exercise and sleep habit, habits of all. We are usually uh, overloaded with, with work, tasks, and, 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 and job overall. And that was the case for me when I was a medical student. And I, there was a season when, to me, it was easier to go to the grocery store and grab some of those chicken uh, breasts, frozen chicken breasts, 
And I that was my diet for a couple of, of weeks. And now that we broke the topic here, I, I this is my just my personal experience. I can really say that at that at that time, I felt more uh, tired. I felt more sleepy. I felt worse than I than I think I ever felt in another moment during my career. And I, I don't have the evidence uh, itself to say I studied that, but as a personal experience, I can say that just being exposed to that kind of frozen food, it really had an impact on my on on my behavior, on my skills, on my productivity. And it's something that I haven't felt uh, again. And I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to to just see how that impacts your metabolism. And that that is something that I wasn't aware of back then. Yep. You know, it's all about awareness. And uh, sometimes the most subtle things just pass right by your awareness for decade after decade, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Just, just like the people that we see every week who've had um, their arteries being burned by their failing carb metabolism and they didn't know it. That's right. So why don't we get into the, the Q&A? That's what most people like the most anyway. So we, uh, we may have made a huge mistake today. What we did was... Um, we gave Dr. Vega access to be able to control some of the what shows on the on the screen. That's Look at right. that smile. <laughs> I, 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 I have the power now. So uh, <laughs> I, I, that is another thing that we wanted to share with you guys. We on the, on the past week, we have been mentioned that sometimes we don't get your question. And that's true. So there's there's so much participation and we're happy about that. But we just have we have just so much time to cover all the, all the questions. And less if I just keep talking, but I'm going to be quick here. Uh, <laughs> if uh, we see that we, we, see, we saw this in other channels. So we're thinking that if, if you want your question to be seen early, if you want to go ahead on the line of the questions, uh, drop us a super chat. So Gilbert is going to show you uh, uh, there on the on the screen how to do a super chat. So that's what we're going to do now. If if somebody drops us a super chat, we're going to go ahead and see that question first, and then we go back to the to the list of questions that we had set up for the day. And let's see how that works. So Parker Reed, uh, hi Dr. Brewer, will you consider protein powders, ultra processed foods? And I believe you did answer him, right, Doc? Yes, I said, uh, here was my perspective. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, here. There you go. I would consider uh, uh, technically uh, protein powders, ultra processed food, because they're crunched up, they're crushed. And, and uh, however, you've, you've got to think a little bit more about the rest of the story. So how when you have crushed up ultra processed carbs, they all hit your body, your bloodstream kabam immediately with a much bigger uh, challenge than, you know, than an ailing pancreas and insulin receptors can, can manage. On the other hand, proteins don't really do that. You know, you listen to Jason Fung and some of the other folks and they'll say, well, proteins do stimulate insulin. Yes, but uh, not much. Bottom line is not much, not like carbs. So I don't really, I'm not concerned about, um, about protein powders causing the kind of damage that, uh, that we're talking about in here. Uh, it's yet another one of those things about the evidence is not that clear because a lot of people, the, the researchers just haven't gone there. Now, Jesus, why don't you tell them what you found in terms of looking at NOVA? And that's the next set of questions. Uh, I did saw some references that mentioned supplements. However, when I went into the NOVA classification, at least on my research, I didn't see anything like that, listed like that. That doesn't mean that it isn't, but I think it means that it doesn't have the impact as other UPFs have. So... 
On a different note, a different question, JMK2921 got us before we got started today. Really, really interesting question, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up. It gives us a good opportunity to talk about it. Now, he's talking about this issue. Okay, do small, dense LDLs actually damage the glycocalyx? That's the intima, the, the uh, business end of the intima, the lining of the artery wall. Or does something else damage it? like high glucose, smoking, SLE. I'm thinking he's, you're talking about systemic lupus erythematosus. I think so. Et cetera. In other words, inflammatory arthritis. Uh, arthritis is plural for arthritis. Inflammatory. Most people don't know it because they're not as common. But for the individual that has one of the key inflammatory arthrit arthritis or arthritis problems, like lupus like um uh arthrodermata uh, arthrodermata arthritis. arthritis yeah clearly the, the classic is rheumatoid arthritis and what what's the other one that i'm thinking of? psoriatic Pro arthritis uh, Sjogren's, Sjogren's disease as well <clears throat> uh so these inflammatory arthritis for the individual that has it are just as big a risk factor as full-blown diabetes. So as you might imagine, uh, given what we do, we see a lot of patients with the inflammatory arthritis. And so that's why we're saying we think that, uh, that JMK is talking about lupus. So the, uh, the answer is yes, the yes to the latter part. And I, we actually uh, put that down in here somewhere. The evidence indicates that the damage is done by chronic high glucose. Smoking will do it, as you mentioned, and perhaps even chronic high insulin. However, I'd like to put a placeholder on that and go back and talk about the chronic high insulin in a minute. Plenty of people have had high LDL for years with things like uh, heterozygous FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, and, you know, given what I do for, given what we do for a living, you can imagine the number of people that we see that have that. Those people usually do fine until, you know, they, they had this FH from the very beginning. It's a genetic uh, variation in their teens, their twenties, their thirties, their forties. They still don't have a problem, but it's when they hit their fifties and most specifically, when they start getting insulin resistance, that's when they start developing, developing a problem. And so it's analogous to uh, somebody standing out in the rain, you know, like on a boat with a, a rain suit. If you've got a good rain suit on, you know, an increase in the rain is just not that big of a deal. But it's when you start developing holes in your rain suit the harder it rains, the faster you get wet. So if you consider the rain suit, the lining of your artery walls, and if you consider the uh, intensity of the rain, the amount of LDL or especially small dense LDL, that becomes an issue. So what you'll typically see with your uh, FH patients, your familial hypercholesterolemia patients, is they do fine until they start getting holes in their rain suit. And then their rain is a little bit more intense. They tend to have a little bit more small dense LDL to start penetrating the, uh, the lining of the artery wall, that glycocalyx, that uh, intima lining, and then start forming more and more plaque. So great question, JMK. Thank you so much for bringing it up. I went around the, the horn a couple of times on that. Hey, Sus, anything that... Uh, I, we needed to say to clear up maybe some of the confusion I might have caused. No, not at all. Uh, I, I think we covered that a few weeks back. We did a short slide on transitosis, which is basically just the mechanism on how particles, one of the mechanisms on how particles, especially, especially cholesterol particles, move through the layers of the in demand between the cells. And that's a normal process. Uh, every day, this type of substances move through the cells once and go in, go out, that's normal. But when you have an inflammatory process that is damaging the glycocalyx and the artery wall, that's when this type of stuff increases and they get stuck there on the intima. But it's 
is, as you mentioned, the, the key question here is the inflammation component and insulin resistance is one of those root causes of inflammation that if you have or if you don't have familiar hypercholesterolemia, when you get that, you're going to see uh, those complications, cardiovascular events. It's, it's worse for people with FH, of course, when they, when they reach that insulin resistant component. So good morning to Bart, but here's another, uh, thank you, Bart. And here's another question related to, it, it's not the same, but there's some relation here. And that is this whole question of what actually causes insulin resistance? Is it uh, having increased use of insulin? I'm going to go back for a minute and say, you know, when I was talking about that description, there's this perception that hyperinsulinemia can also cause plaque. <clears throat> I'm not so sure. Here's why. And it has, again, to do with a little bit finer analysis of the evidence and the detail. It's really clear that people, if you do an OGTT, uh, you get a lot more people. You understand, you find a lot more people that have carb metabolism problems. But you get even more if you do what's called an insulin response or an insulin survey. In fact, um, you'll probably get about 50% more um, or 60% more if you, if you do an OGTT than if you just do uh, what your typical doc does. And that is, uh, the typical doc picks this up on a random fasting glucose. If you ask the doc, the doc will say, and, and I'm not making this up, there are clearly studies which show exactly the, the facts that I'm saying. If you ask the doc, the doc will say, I'll look at hemoglobin A1C. That's wrong because hemoglobin A1C, the uh, American Association of Clinical and Endocrinologists has said that's not a great way to diagnose diabetes because it's a hemoglobin test. Anything that impacts hemoglobin, uh, kidney disease, liver disease, um, genetics, pregnancy, all these things impact hemoglobin. They can also impact, impact that test. So you need to use an OGTT. So you get a huge jump in the, again, 50 to 80% increase in the number of people that you find have problems if you actually do an OGTT. But if you don't look at uh, insulin, you miss another 20%. Jesus and I were working with a patient, I think it was just last week, where, yes, by the OGTT, it was clear that he had some insulin resistance, but it appeared mild. It was, you know, he was peaking at what, like 160 at one hour. Mm -hmm. But then you go down and you look, and he had huge insulin. What, what were the insulin numbers? Do you remember? I think we're around, oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. It was more, it, it, yeah, it was more than 50, definitely more 150, than 50. 150, 180, yeah. something like that. And, that, you know, your peak insulin at one hour should be no more than 50. So uh, even if uh, your typical baildonine doc were looking at this and just doing an OGTT, for example, they would still be missing the vast majority of the problem just because they didn't look at insulin. Now... <clears throat> That brings back the question, does hyperinsulinemia cause plaque? Well, you do see a lot of people that have um, hyperinsulinemia. Their hyperglycemia, though, is not as apparent. The point that I would make, and the reason I go into this and say, I'm not so sure that it's the insulin itself, is because you're seeing hyperinsulinemia. You, you don't see hyperinsulinemia unless somebody has insulin resistance. So already you've got uh, ailing insulin receptors. You've got whatever caused those ailing insulin receptors, which is usually going to be some, uh, some cytokines from body fat and or just uh, some problems associated with aging. So <clears throat> I am not 100% convinced that just insulin itself alone causes that problem because you don't ever see just insulin, hyperinsulinemia alone. You do, but that's, that's beyond rare. Now, I've gone off of three bunny holes, and I'm not sure that... I'm, let me get back to, <laughs> to the question. <laughs> let, let, let's, make, let's make sure that we did answer the question. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the clip ones, the new the new blockbuster drugs, Ozempic. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Ozempic's one of these. It's the the flagship drug out of this, and yes, it's great for diabetics. Um, so would long term use of them increase insulin resistance? Oh, okay, so. Here's the thing. Yes, they do. The GLP ones do stimulate the pancreas to increase to to re release insulin. I don't. I, I think that's really a short term mechanism. I think the biggest mechanism for GLP ones is the fact that they close, uh, they decrease stomach emptying. And what happens there? We don't eat as much. We get full quicker, and we don't eat as much. And guess what? You start losing weight. And so it's the long-term effect that really has much more of an impact. I know when we start people on GLP ones, yes, you will see a significant decrease in their uh, A1Cs quickly, you know, within a month, uh, and that clearly has to has to have some at least some to do with that process. But uh, the other the other point I'll make is that I, I am skeptical that insulin itself actually causes insulin resistance. Um, I don't know how we will ever study that uh, on a practical basis. Uh, what we do know, the number one cause for it is not obesity. It's not body fat. That's the number two cause. The number one cause is aging. Aging causes insulin resistance. Uh, a critically important number two is uh, body fat. We used to think body fat was an inert energy storage tissue. And uh, what's number three, Jesus? Pop quiz. Mm, I'm thinking sleep, but I think that might be number four, or number five. Well, sleep is a really good point. And I think it's an unsung hero. But uh, remember 9P21, the genetics that we're genetics. talking about. Yeah, yeah 9P21. You, we were talking about it this week. We had a patient asking us about, you know, what is, should I get tested for 9P21? Or, oh, I have 9P21. Um, what should I do about that? Well, the 9P21, if, if any of you have read the book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene by Brad Bale and Amy Dunning, it's a good book. The gene they're talking about is 9P21. Uh, over half of us have a uh, disease gene in that space. It's not a single SNP or a single nucleot uh, uh, nu nucleotide polymorphism, for those of you that are geeks and scientists out there, a variation. You might think of it as mutation, but technically a mutation is when you only, it's the first time it happens. After it's passed on, it's now called a, a polymorphism or a variation. Um, <clears throat> do, you, do you think it's worth going down that bunny hole of talking about 9P21, Jesus, or am I getting too, too far afield here? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it's interesting uh, because we always mention genetics, but hardly ever go deeper onto that aspect. And some people do need to check that out. Well, why don't you tell us what the uh, what the the question that the patient had for us this week, and we'll talk about it for a minute. Well, from what I remember, he basically was positive for both that and the atrial fibrillation gene uh, for for Q forty five. I think it is for Q twenty five. And um, he we were we were basically discussing the results of that genetic testing because. At some moment, it said, uh, I, I found some research that said that we don't know exactly how that 9P21, it's involving on cardiovascular disease. However, you did point out that it's mostly because it's a diabetes gene. And that diabetes gene is connecting any cardiovascular issues and colon cancer. So anyone who has positive 9P21 might have higher risk of colon cancer and cardiovascular disease. And that is because it's impact, impacting glucose metabolism. Uh, there is also a uh, damage or more uh, risk of damage to the intima and, or the media layer of the artery, better said, which is the muscular layer of the artery. So these people who has, ha, are positive on that genetic testing have higher risk of aortic aneurysms 
and that's because uh, that damage of the media layer of the artery. So uh, a little bit of history about that 9P21, the quote heart attack gene. Brad and Amy called it the heart attack gene because it's associated with heart attacks. If you go back to Eric Topol, and those of you who don't know that name, he was he was a cardiologist involved in research for many years, uh, actually headed up the Scripps Institute at one point in La Jolla, uh, and took a gig as the uh, editor for Medscape, a continuing medical education program. He did a really good video on the history of 9P21. It was originally called a, quote, cancer gene because they saw it associated with things like uh, some of the GI cancers like colon cancer. Then later on, uh, at about the years before Brad and Amy wrote the book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene, nine, they began to recognize that 9P21 was associated with heart attack risk. Well, after that, they began to notice something else. And that's what Jesus brought up. Yes, there's some uh, media layer problems associated with uh, abdominal as aneurysm, but the bigger issue is 9P21 is associated with diabetes. ka -ching. you know, it's like if we've got a gene that's associated with diabetes, clearly that gene is going to be a major risk factor for heart attack, stroke, uh, and the disability associated with it. So for those of you who have hung in with us going through all those bunny holes, thank you so much. And thank you, D. Dutton, for bringing up that question. Does, um, would GLP-1s actually cause insulin resistance by increasing the output of insulin? And I don't think so, but nobody will be able to tell you, probably for a very long time. We, ha we, ha we have a super chat that we want to address we are changing our methods right now so gmk she sent us uh, sent us a 20 dollar super chat we appreciate it uh the cardiovascular and metabolic information provided by dr brewer and dr vega is priceless thank you so much and unfortunately too many pcps and cardiologists don't have the time and or inclination to answer our questions that's a reality every everywhere in the world let me tell you that's the same thing over here in mexico uh, especially on public health, public health, they only have like 15 minutes per patient. So they don't have the time. And sometimes they don't have the interest of addressing the specific questions. So that's, that's true. Very true. And very thank you. But I, I would add something else. And we've mentioned it before. I've mentioned it many times. Your typical internist, cardiologist, even family practitioner doesn't know how to make a diagnosis of prediabetes. That's really clear in the evidence out there. So there's a huge knowledge gap there as well. And that's why you, you, we have so many patients coming to us uh, very frustrated because their cardiologist or their internist is chasing LDL. Awesome. So uh, the sensitivity, good morning from Georgia. Good morning. Rick Folia from Atlanta. Dr. Brewer mentioning good morning to all of them. Bart Robinson. I like the music intro. I like I like it too. <laughs> Can you hey, tell? <laughs> let me ask you, who picked it, Jesus? I I show Doctor Brewer, and I, I think you. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna send this back to you for one moment. I I don't know who mentioned Malagueña, and that that's what it came. Yeah, <laughs> and I and I sent it to you, and we were discussing with James, Nurse James, who is really skilled on on playing guitar, and yeah, so I I know. For, for those work. of you who have heard Spanish guitar, Malagueña is the classic Spanish guitar thing. Uh, but, you know, you can't just pick up something off the Internet and use it in your video or uh, it, you'll get a strike. So <clears throat> the, qu the challenge is to find a good version of Malagueña uh, that we can use for the intro. And I just don't know that we're going to get there. We tried to get uh, James to do that because he does some Spanish guitar, but his reaction was, whoa, no, that's sort of like, uh, that is way out there. That's not my skill set, guys. Not going to do it. 
Uh, the sensitivity. Good morning, doctors. Good to see and hear that the dynamic duo once more. I saw that like a few weeks back. The sensitivity. Uh, thank you so much. Katie, which way? So glad you're talking about this topic today. Thank you so much. We're we're trying. Um, we have topics like for almost half of next year already, and we keep gathering more info and info. And we just have so many Wednesdays in the year to cover this stuff. Rick Folia, protein shakes, they don't have the fat needed for the body to properly process, correct? So most of the protein shakes goes to glucose fat instead of muscle, right? Um, I don't know. I haven't seen enough research on protein shakes. I have seen research on protein supplementation. Um, I think we're making the assumption that fat necessarily goes to create glucose or goes to be metabolized. metabolized metabolized has glucose but i don't think that's the case i don't know what you think that well i think one of the bigger challenges is something that we're not even thinking about the majority of people that i see taking protein shakes don't get adequate muscle challenge they're not doing uh high intensity intervals training they're not doing or at least adequate levels and they're clearly not doing adequate resistance training well, of the two, I, I see more resistance training than than hit training, but still. <clears throat> and, and then there are those <clears throat> like myself for about 20 years who are just doing aerobics. That does not build muscle. That does not have the protein needs that you're going to you're going to where you're going to actually use protein that you're that you're taking in. So the big, by far the biggest challenge that I see is people taking in protein that their body doesn't need because they're not challenging it. Yeah, if, if you're making the assumption that just for eating protein, you're gonna get muscle, that's the error over there. Protein is gonna be uh, converted or broke into amino acids and that's gonna be used elsewhere on the body. But I don't think that's necessarily gonna go to glucose metabolism. In fact, that brings up a related point, and that and this next comment is related as well. And that is, what is the best thing to prevent um, cognitive decline? Now, most people think it's doing crossword puzzles, doing mind exercises, and the bottom line is, nope. There was a really good series of studies on this uh, about two years ago, and I did a series of videos on it. The bottom line is, physical exercise hard physical exercise is the number one uh, proven way of preventing cognitive decline. Now, why is that? Again, because you're stimulating your body to get into that uh, repair mode. And that repair mode works, you know, one of the, <clears throat> the quotes that we make a lot is quotes that you hear from bodybuilders. They talk about the new bodybuilder coming into the group and he works and he works and he works on his arms, but he doesn't grow. And then they have to instruct him and tell him, if you want to grow your arms, work on your legs. Why is that? Because you're changing your metabolism. So uh, this works in so many different spaces. It doesn't just work in terms of uh, bodybuilding. It works in terms of preventive prevention of diabetes and insulin resistance. It works in terms of, therefore, uh, prevention of cognitive decline. So, you know, cognitive decline is now is more often called type three diabetes by uh, world class researchers at this point uh, than anything else. So uh, start thinking about uh, getting the creating the need for that protein. Uh, it's very easy to slosh around some more protein into our belly, but it's not so easy to create that need. Definitely. D. Dutton, exercise and brain, brain repair were discussed recently in the Open Journal Scientific Reports. They believe that exercise release lactate is used as brain fuel and uh, drives the release of BDNF, brain-derived natriuretic factor. I don't know what it is. That's a, you know, that's a certainly one option. Another option, which I tend to lean towards because I see so much through the lens of undiagnosed prediabetes. I see that as a major issue. 
Other comments before we move on, Dr. Vega? I wasn't aware of lactate being used as fuel in the brain specifically for that. The brain usually needs glucose and oxygen. And yes, there's some evidence that it can even use uh, uh, ketonic acid, as a word. Yeah, so, I can't. I, I, one, some of the ketones you can train yeah. your brain to use ketones, and I'm the most common one I'm blanking on as well. I'm yeah. glad to see you having that. Uh, I'm 65. You're what, 30 something? Yeah, 32. And but yet now you're having uh, brain word blocks too. So I, 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 that's that's an issue with me. Like I've been improving a lot since changing my lifestyle component like from the last past year i stopped mm. a little bit after my ankle injury i'm trying to recover that uh but yes that happened that had used to happen a lot to me in the past it's it's less common now but yeah I have, I have a high genetic load for diabetes let me tell you that oh you do yeah and i do too you know, uh but the other thing is you have to be uh realistic in terms of your expectations you know when you get frustrated about I can't remember a term that I use all the time, but the last time I used it was a month ago. Then, you know, and you're under a little bit of pressure to remember it now. Mm, that's pretty hard. So neither one of us yeah. use that, the term that, of that specific uh, um, keto fuel that, that your body makes. I'm, I'm sure hopefully down at the bottom, we'll have a few people tell, reminding us what we're the keto, the ketone that we're trying to remember. Rick Folia, thank you so much. Hit the like button. Uh, we forget about that. Subscribe to the newsletter, hit the like button. And most of all, take this content and refer it uh, to others on other social media like Facebook. Well, Facebook is clear. Uh, we're pre co-presenting on Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, Instagram, other places. Because when the AI, the algorithm sees somebody come in from another uh, another social media, that means they want a big, you know, they want a couple of eyeballs for a while, and that's a big deal for them. And so they will uh, they'll help push the uh, the content. And it's interesting because we don't have that uh, huge follow up on Facebook. Uh, the assumption would be that for the age group, we were expecting that Facebook will be bigger than it is, and just, just by clicking the like button and sharing and subscribing, that helps a lot of the channel to grow and get to more people. So um, this is an interesting point. You know, it it um, it it helps you to understand that it never fails to. We will never fail to create misunderstandings. Rick, uh, that book's been out what two years now, Jesus? Yeah, but I don't know if he's referring to the chapter that you're writing with David. Um, oh, yes. I bet it's that. You know, really good question. And I'm blanking on his name. I'll remember it after the show's done. I'm sure. I, I, know, it's, I know it's David. I don't remember his last name. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm blanking on it. Um, it's uh, Here's the thing. Uh, he actually is going. Um, he thinks he's about to get a, a large publishing house deal. So when those things happen, they slow things down for another year. But that's okay because they get a heck of a lot more eyeballs. So um, it's, you know, he's doing the right thing. It takes patience and time, but he's doing the right thing. B. Brad for one. Good morning. What are your thoughts on the Mediterranean diet? It appears to be carb heavy. Can I start on this one, Jesus? I will just say he's right. Go ahead. <laughs> well you took my you stole my thunder and, and here's the thing we didn't say that i don't know if we said that first maybe so but it's delineated extremely well in a book by nina teicholtz it's called the big fat surprise and she makes a point that this was just it was a marketing concept and yes it's way too heavy in grains these, this and the damage that's been done to the perception and psyche of the health community is just we're decades later and we still haven't recovered from it. Look it up. Everybody will say, you know, whole grains are good for you. Well, then go back and look at 
whole wheat bread, the glycemic value, 70 something, white bread, no, 60 something, white bread, 70 something, and pure sugar, what, 50. So it's like, come on. Uh, if you're, if you're, if you cannot healthily metabolize carbs, like most of us, especially by the time we're age 50 and 60, uh, the Mediterranean diet, as it is usually described, is not good for you. There's too many grains, too many carbs, too many grapes, too many raisins. Uh, once you get all of that stuff out of there, the rest of it, the pescatarian uh, component of the diet, the, uh, the fiber components of the diet, those are excellent. But just beware of the, quote, Mediterranean diet. Thank you so much, Brad, for uh, bringing that up. And those of you who are going to start hating on us, you know, I've always we've always said the same thing. A, Mediter a modified Mediterranean diet, meaning get the carbs out. I have two comments. One, Daniel Trevor. Daniel Trevor. Yes. Excellent. Daniel Trevor. I mean, he was he was a guest on the show. I mean, we want to know, we want to be able to remember his name. Yes. He's a really, he, he's, he, if you haven't watched that video, he's an incredible like, example how ne how on how it's never too late to change your lifestyle. He Absolutely. got a six pack and age like fifty or sixty, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, so that's impressive. And the other one that I want to say about the Mediterranean diet is, if you compare Mediterranean diet with your standard American diet, of course, it's better. I mean, it depends on the yeah. lens that we're looking at. It's the best Better one. Than, than, two, than two bowls and, and, of cereal with two glasses of orange juice for breakfast every morning. Yeah. And any, and any, every, any research is going to tell you that. Right. That's, that, that's, that's truth. It's the best one? Well, we don't think so. That's, that's why uh, we're mentioning just adjust that to re be really a low-carb Mediterranean diet. And yeah, then you're really good to go. Now we have a very interesting and unusual story. Clean Slate just received CIMT one year follow up from cardio risk. At 67, my arterial age is 66, down from 74. Plaque burden is 0.81, down from oh, uh, 0.89. Thank you, Doc. Been watching for five years. Thank you so much, Clean Slate. And I will, uh, I'll take a digression on that for a second. Uh, there, it's very unusual to see a decrease, um, a decrease on that. In fact, if you look at by far our most popular video, it's where my own uh, plaque decreased. And <clears throat> so, when that happens, there's a there's a dangerous side to it because so many people come to this space expecting that they're going to wipe out their plaque. That's not really a practical goal. Um, I, I'm, I, I have seen three people that in looking at it, I would say, yep, yeah, we probably did decrease our plaque. Uh, Clean Slate, I would love to take a look at your information. I'd love to talk with you and love to have you on the show if, you, if you'd be willing, um, because it's such an unusual thing. That doesn't mean that it's unusual to be able to reduce your cardiovascular risk. Almost every one of us, it's rare that somebody cannot practically expect to decrease your cardiovascular risk. And that's from uh, stabilizing that plaque. That's what we really want to do. We want to stabilize it. And uh, the way to do it is pretty clear. And when you do it on the CIMT, it's also pretty clear. Uh, I don't know how much time, how much time do you have today, Jesus? Uh, I think I have the same time that you have. Okay, so I've got an 1130 that I need to prep for. So I've, I've got about two more minutes. Okay. Uh, why don't we select a couple of them and then uh, move on? Yeah, well, I, if we can take the two minutes just for a quick comment. Uh, well, and the next one, this, this comment on the next one, when you get at CAMT, uh, oh, I know everybody focuses on arterial age. Don't focus too much on that. That's not really providing the key information. Take a look at the characteristics of the plaque that has been shown. 
anything about 1.3 uh, is going to be considered plaque. And it's important to see if it is echogenic, heterogeneous, or soft. Anything that is heterogeneous or echogenic is calcified as stable plaque. So that's one of the most important things to look at when you're reading a CIMT report. And the other, the other comment I saw this from the JMK. My cardiologist tried to gaslight me when I told him I was considering the keto diet to improve my type two diabetes. He told me that LDL will go up and put me at higher risk for heart attack. So, I'm not defending any cardiologist. I don't think they're trying to gaslight anyone. It's just that that's what they were what they were taught on on their residency program. They were taught LDL is bad, and and that's it. So, you know, it, in some ways it's worse than, than cardiologists not having time to share this information. It's they don't know it. Yeah. And, and the worst thing is they're not willing to change. And they're not willing to learn. Paradigms. Yeah, exactly. That, that's the worst part. Uh, yeah. Based on arrogance more often than time. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of quick points and then we're going to, uh, or one quick point and then we're going to, um, I'm going to have to go. Ramiz, R- greetings from the UK. And Ramiz is asking, could you dedicate an episode for FH, familial hypercholesterolemia? Uh, Ramiz, just to let you know, I have several videos that are specifically on that. But yes, Jesus, if you'll add that to the queue. Now, the other side is, um, as Jesus was pointing out earlier, we're about six months down already in terms of uh, lists in the queue, or a year. One, one year already, yeah. But maybe we can take some um, some Let's simple stuff. Time. Yeah, move it up, some simple stuff, and at least do a, a, um, short, a short form or two, and then see how, you know, see how much interest there is. If there's a lot of interest, we'll go ahead and put it in a long form too, move it up. Sure. So thank you. Uh, if you didn't get your uh, your question dealt with, we've got a lot of them. Uh, and again, we certainly appreciate the interest. Um, the as... JMK, JMK question was an example of that. Uh, if she hadn't donated that super chart, we might not have been able to, to get to her question. Yeah. So that's you know, a couple of ways to do it. Number one, get in early and get the question in early uh, before the show starts. Or the other one is to, uh, you know, to hit us with a super chat. Uh, that was Jesus's idea. I like the way he's thinking because the, uh, the more contributions we get like that, the more information we can get out to the rest of the world. And we get, just like today, we get uh, a lot of very nice feedback every day that we're saving lives with this content. And that's why we're doing it. Um, I, I get grief uh, because of, hey, doc, I miss the old shaky paper days. You know, I used to do that. And that was really bad, but the content was appreciated and uh, we started getting patients coming in. And instead of retiring, I started seeing those patients and I took that money and applied it back to finding and uh, recruiting really good talent like Dr. Jesus Vega here, uh, Gilbert, who's co-hosting with us today, Aspen, who helps run it, Michelle, uh, Miranda, just James, uh, just uh, lots of really good people on the team. James uh, Raffi's doing uh, work on the um, editing side. Yeah. On the yeah, and I think it, and I, I think I said Aspen. I meant to say uh, Gilbert's running the co-host today. Aspen helps coordinate all of our digital uh, activities and the um, uh, the video editing. And then we've got um, Craig and. Um, and Fred, who have joined us recently as well, more on the management and uh, personnel recruiting and training side. So got a, a growing team. We're excited and we're saving lives. And if you'd like to help us do that, do a super chat. Awesome. Thank you so much for your interest today. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.